So, good morning. Oh, there's so many of you. It's, it's a bit scary and a bit amazing. So, actually, when I started this journey, when I started doing my PhD in machine learning, like four and a half years ago, you, like, didn't exist. Right? We, we could have a machine learning seminar, and there would be four people there asking questions like, well, so you're doing sloppy statistics? Is that it? And now we're like this big community, 450 people here, and we're like literally doing self-driving cars here in Gothenburg. It's amazing. I'm, I'm really happy to be part of this, uh, and I feel very lucky. Okay. Today I'm going to try and convince you that the way we are currently doing language with machine learning, or with deep learning in particular, is great but something is missing. And I think it might be the time now to start looking forward to like, the next step to solve some problems that we are currently not able to solve. So that kind of, that's kind of the outlook. Not like simple things like self-driving cars, but even more difficult things. OK. So. But to get there, I will just mention a few real success stories that we have seen lately. So, for instance, language modeling. I mean, it works great, and it has improved the lives of many people and products. It, it's a really good thing. I mean, every time you use your mobile phone, it will kind of tell you the next word that you are going to type before you type it. And that's because we have a, an awesome, very powerful language model that has computed the statistics and know if you say I love, then you probably want to say you afterwards. And it suggests the top words. This works really, really well. And you can estimate the probability of a sentence, so all of a sudden you can do speech recognition much, much, much better. Because the same waveform, it can fit many, many different type, many different sentences, but some sentences are just gibberish. It's not something that people actually say. So you can estimate the probability really well, and now our speech recognition system works really well. So it has had a lot of impact. And you can even generate stuff from them. So this guy, I mean, this is from, uh, from a movie script that they generated just by doing that. I mean, you could imagine having your phone and then just selecting the most probable word, and it kind of created this long movie script, and then they made a movie out of it. And you can watch it online. It's the guy from Silicon Valley. It's really funny, but it's weird. But all we are doing is learning or really computing the distribution of language. We can now sample sentences, but they are random. We can estimate how probable the sentence is. Hmm. But there's something missing there, right? OK, so another success story, machine translation. So I read a paper recently uh, that Microsoft actually claims to have uh, like over <coughs> human performance in machine translation between English and Chinese, which is Completely amazing. I mean, if you if you read the fine print, you realize that it's not really true. I mean, it's not like they're going to start uh, doing like poetry and books and literature using these systems. But still, it's an amazing product. It works really well. But so what would we do there? Well, it's a very similar system. You have an input and an output sequence, and now you estimate the probability of an output system given conditioned on the input sentence. That's the only real difference. And then you can generate an output. And it's trained using like parallel text. So you have this input, and you want this output, and you compute that uh, function. I mean, you estimate that function, and then you can use it. But I mean, it's not like, I mean, if you have some person who knows both English and Chinese, sounds like a very uh, nice, creative, uh, interesting person to talk to, but you don't really want to talk to this algorithm, because it, this is all it does, right? And you could uh, even argue that it is doing exactly the Chinese room uh, kind of argument here. 
It's something in the middle that doesn't understand anything. It gets an input a message. It has this big, huge book, and it takes the input message, and it looks through this book for the, for, for the translation of it, and then gives the output. I mean, this is really a glorified lookup table. It's not exactly doing that. I mean, it, it does do some generalization, because otherwise you would have to have an infinitely large book. So it's slightly better, but still, it's not that far off. But OK, this is impressive. But obviously, the agents learning to translate or learning to generate language or estimate the probability, they haven't really acquired a functional language that they can do something with. They can't converse with you. And, and we actually tried. So we had a master thesis a few years back uh, where, uh, where some students tried this. They tried to do a, a, a like sequence to sequence conversion between an input to an output and, and having a, so training a dialogue system as machine translation. And, and there's been other papers. Facebook did it as well at the same time, but using much, much more GPU power, and they got better results. But it's still silly. It doesn't really work. So uh, this is a funny example of what can happen when you do this. So th these guys, they were actually online for a while. So someone bought two of those Google assistants and then let them have a conversation with each other. And then they put a webcam on it, and it was alive. So you could just uh, stream in there and have, have a look what they were talking about. I mean, they do some things reasonably well. Let's say, do you watch Doctor Who? Sometimes, do you? That's a reasonable response. It's a high probability response. But if you go through it all, you realize that this is completely pointless. They're not trying to achieve anything. They're just estimating a probable response. It works for a couple of questions, but then if you're a human, you're going to grow tired of it. So what I would like to do today is to suggest an alternative paradigm. I want to, let's say, go beyond this lookup table approach to language and see if we can do something, something else still going to use neural networks, but we want to do something else. We want to use language as a tool, OK? So instead of having this, let's say, dead, canned text, this big corpus, let's say Wikipedia, people usually use that, or some news corpus, and then compute statistics and so on. Instead of doing that, using that text, we want to see if we can let agents develop their own language to solve some task, because then they will have an actual connection to that language. They will have a grounded language. They will know what the, the word that they invented mean, because they actually invented it to do something. So that is what we will try. So we will try to go from the most probable response in this case to say this Mia, or whatever it's called, should say, hmm, think like, OK, so what should I now respond to fulfill this goal that I have, whatever goal that may be? That would be awesome, right? So instead of having an assistant that has a lot of functions, you can kind of say, oh, set my alarm for tomorrow. That's fine. That's OK. But wouldn't it be even more awesome if you could say, I want to be on time to work? And, and then it will have that as its like end goal. And if you are snoozing the hell out of that button, it, it will increase the volume and start threatening you or, I don't know, try different things to get you up, right? And if you have a meeting tomorrow in Stockholm, maybe it's just like, well, you haven't booked train tickets. Why haven't you? Because that's the end goal. So you have a higher level goal. All right. Now, if you are a machine learning person, you may have already realized that, OK, so this guy is trying to move from supervised learning into the domain of reinforcement learning. Uh, and yes, that is true. And luckily, we, we have some introduction about reinforcement learning, and even about the mouse and the maze. So this is going to be easy for you now. I, I will say a few words. So as I would see, Supervised learning is solved. It's very, very easy. It's like uh, Eric said, it, and that's like the low-hanging fruit is solving 
the vision problems. You can do that in a supervised manner. It's, it's simple. I mean, it's simple. It's, it's a, maybe a harsh word, but it's still, it's, it's very, very doable. Reinforcement learning and, and these types of problems, it's not as simple, but it's very similar to supervised learning. So I think you can understand it. I will go through it quickly. So what you have here is you have some kind of environment, this maze that the mouse needs to navigate. So instead of having labels, instead of actually saying what it's supposed to do, it has an environment to work with. Like I have today, I'm standing here in front of you, I might say something really stupid. You're not going to tell me what to say exactly so I can update my neural network. You're just going to look at me with, with a, an angry you know, eyes or something. And I will get a bad feeling and I will update my weights, hopefully. And on the other side of it, if this uh, mouse you know, moves around this maze and finds a piece of cheese, then those actions that led to that is going to be reinforced. So you get some, some reward back. But it's, this reward is, um, is much weaker than having supervision. However, this is much, much more flexible because you can do things that are much more general. You can move from having, I mean, we can't really label everything. It's impossible. But we can do what animals do. I mean, reinforcement learning is how animals and humans learn to do things. So everything a human can learn to do is possible to learn. Again, you don't really want to have a random agent going on the street, uh, driving, of course. So you may need some kind of, you usually need some kind of model uh, simulator that you can train your, your algorithm in first. But still, it, it's very general. Uh, it's biologically plausible, which is interesting for the paper that I'm going to describe. Um, but the signal is really weak. And that is because you're not getting the correct answer, you're just getting a slap on the hand or, or a piece of cheese. And it's not as uh, easy to learn from, so we say it has a high sample uh, complexity. You will need to train it a lot more, and also it's kind of unstable. So I'm giving you a few of those. If you get into this, you should know that it's not as easy. Uh, but then again, there are some really interesting rewards that you, you may get out in the end. Okay. So, we wanted to see if we could use this framework of learning and kind of turn it around. So, we know that humans do things, we learn things using reinforcement learning. This is established. Uh, or that's the thesis anyway. There are evidence for it, so it's not just a guess. So could we use this type of framework to answer questions about cognition? So uh, luckily, uh, I got to uh, collaborate with Assad, uh, who, who knows much, much more about cognitive science than I do, so if you have technical questions, please, uh, you know, reserve them for today, and if you want to talk about deep cognitive stuff, you should just call him, he's not here. But the question that we addressed is, okay, so you have a color space. Now, colors are not discrete. We think about colors as being discrete, but they're really a big blob of frequencies. And for some reason, humans divide this blob of frequencies into different discrete colors. And for a long time we thought that uh, all humans probably did this in exactly the same way. Turns out that's not really true. There are some patterns. We do similar things, but different cultures use different number of colors. So if you live in the jungle, then there are some cultures that only use three colors. Uh, and if you're Spanish, I think you use like 15, and if you're English, you use like 
I don't know, remember exactly, by 14 or 13 or something. So there are some differences, and there are a huge difference between um, different people. Uh, I mean, all of the weird color names I hear from my wife, I call almost the same. But I don't know if she has better eyesight than me or just more intelligent. But uh, on the level of uh, population, we can still see some patterns. Okay, so when they collected this uh, data, it was uh, uh, Terry Regier uh, et al. They actually went around the world and they, and they did this test with, uh, with different people of different tribes in Amazon uh, and also with like English speakers and, and Spanish speakers and some other Western uh, speakers and Eastern and so on. So uh, that's called the World Color Survey. So what they did was exactly this. They had two people, two participants. Uh, this participant were given the color T, which is just some color. Now, you would think that when this participant sees, we can call, let's call her Alice. So when Alice sees T, she represents that color as a, rep, uh, as a distribution over colors in her head. Because you, you, we're not that exact uh, about color. We, well, at least not me. And then, given that uh, distribution, she tries to convey it, that distribution to Bob. And uh, she does that by saying blue, and Bob reconstructs this uh, on the other side. And, uh, and that is how the game was played with humans. Now, of course, we are not really interested in humans, so let's scrap them. We're not going to go around the world. I wanted to go around the world. It seemed like a fun thing to do, but I'm stuck in the lab. Uh, so we use these guys instead. So now uh, Alice is a nice flamboyant speaker robot there, and the listener uh, over here, uh, let's call him Bob. Let's continue with that. Okay, but since these are robots, we're going to make it a, a slightly more technical. And there will be a, a little bit of math uh, now. I hope that's okay. I don't think it would not be okay because you look like you're hungry for math. It's not that much. And, uh, and I will go through everything. So we have the color terms. So this, could, this is a set of just, let's say, from 2 to 13 color terms. Uh, you can think of them as blue, red, green, blah, blah, blah. But they're just symbols. We are not assigning any value to them. Uh, they will get to do that themselves. And there we go. And the this set of colors, U, is is this palette. Uh, so this was the palette of colors that we used during that world color survey. And so we want to compare to human samples, and therefore we use the same. Okay. So, let's see what's going on here. Now, this robot sees this uh, color T, which will be one of these guys. Uh, from that color T, it oh, there we go. Estimates uh, uh, this distribution over color terms and samples from there, a color term. And then the other guy now computes this uh, argmax, so saying which color is the most probable according to, to my uh, distribution. Given that color word, what color is he probably thinking of? Okay. Now, uh, obviously, all of you are thinking, but where the hell is the deep learning coming in? And that's here. So these two guys, they are simple deep neural networks. So they are just like you, you feed in the color and you feed in the word, depending on which of these two you're talking about, and then you will compute this distribution using a simple softmax. So it's not more complicated than that. Now, of course, you could argue that, well, this is a nice feed-forward thing. Could we not just do an end-to-end -end learning? Well, we can't because these W's up there, they're discrete symbols. So you can't propagate a gradient over them. So therefore, we need to do this uh, as a reinforcement learning problem instead. 
And that kind of makes sense, right? Because if I'm talking to you, I'm not really able to back propagate a gradient back from you to me over the air. So we wanted to stay uh, close to what's biologically okay, uh, since we want to you know, actually show what humans do. Okay, so we're uh, going for an algorithm. Uh, it's a deep reinforcement learning algorithm. It's called reinforce. Now you may have heard of like DQN, deep Q learning. It's another deep reinforcement learning algorithm. Um, this one is in the family of, it's called policy gradient. So it's, it's super simple. And I will give you exactly how it works, and I will give you intuition for why it works. I will not prove anything. But it's very, very simple. So if you understand supervised learning, you will, it will be easy for you to, to understand this as well. So uh, that's good news, right? On this side, we're going to have this um, uh, like obje uh, objective function that we're going to maximize. OK, so what do we have here? So if you've done some statistics or if you've done reinforcement learning, you know about the scoring functions. You can really you can think about this about as two things. This is the reward, and this is the scoring function. So what's the scoring function? Score function. Uh, well, it's very simple. So what you're doing here is this function estimates the probability of a certain word given that color tile t. Okay, so if we take the gradient of this, because we're using gradient descent, right? That's all we do in this room. Uh, maybe not, I'm not sure. But the deep learning people, we're only using gradient descent. So if we take the gradient of this, this gradient is going to point in a direction that uh, points towards increasing the probability of doing whatever it was doing again. Does that make sense? So if we change the parameters in that direction that that gradient points, we will increase the probability of choosing that word again when we see that color tile. Okay. So if we have that part here, and this is the reward, if this reward is positive, if we manage to solve the task and got a positive reward, then we will move in the direction that increases the probability of doing that again. If we get a negative reward, then we will decrease the probability of doing that again. It's that simple. And that's exactly what we're doing. And this, uh, this is actually a contextual bandit type of problem, so it's a pretty simple problem. If you don't know what that is, it's fine. Uh, but that just means that we, we, we don't need to have states that go over time. We have one state and we compute uh, one action. So that's the reinforce for you. Uh, on the other side of it, it's just supervised learning because you know after this has played out, you know which color tile were selected, so you can update those weights um, just as you update any neural network with a softmax, it's cross entropy error. And as you can see, I mean, they're really simple and really, sorry, uh, similar, these two. <clears throat> now I removed some minor details and sums and stuff to make it easy to see, but this is pretty much the gist of what's going on. Uh, then you sum these two, obviously, and you, and you optimize that objective. Okay. Now, obviously, I didn't really, I left something out. So that is, okay, so that's reward. How do we set that? And it turns out that this is going to be really important. So depending on what kind of reward function you have, you will get different behaviors. And, I mean, your reward function is going to be tied to the environment, so you can use exactly this reinforce algorithm to, to train uh, an end-to-end self-driving car if you have a reward that's going to be, if you know, hit the pedestrian minus one and you know, get to McDonald's plus 10 or something, right? So how we compute this is, is important. Um, so in our case, uh, we tried two different things. Uh, one would be if you guess the correct tile, you will get plus one, and if you 
guess the incorrect one, you will get minus one. So that would be the, the simplest one. Now, we wanted to see if, if our eyes, how they are uh, constructed, if that influences how this uh, color space is, is being uh, constructed. So we also used a different, a slightly more advanced um, kind of reward that uses something called uh, Scilab color space, which is supposedly constructed in such a way that similar colors for our eyes are close in this color space and, and those are, that are not so close, um, similar, sorry, are, uh, are further apart. Uh, so in that case, it would just be the similarity between the color, the target color and, and the color it got from the argmax and, and then into that similarity function. Did that make sense? You're nodding. Awesome. All right. Okay. So some uh, some nice pictures. So running this, uh, you get uh, these types of results. So what you can see here is, uh, so I have after training them, after them uh, like deciding what word to use for what color, they decided to partition the space like this. So you can see that it has something here that's kind of yellow, so a word that means kind of yellow, something that is a bit bluish, I guess, light colors at the top. Red is actually wrapping around, that's not very easy to see. But. And then uh, we can compare that to uh, a human language. So this is from, uh, uh, from some guys living in the jungle, uh, or in, in our Amazon, to be more specific. So it's a, a language that has five color terms, and, and that is the same number of color terms that we allowed in the picture up there. And we can see some striking similarities. We do actually learn something that is pretty similar. So it seems like uh, what's going on in this uh, similarity metric does capture something about why we partition the space the way we do. That's pretty interesting. Uh, now, of course, there are different languages actually do not do the exact same border. I'm kind of cherry-picked one that I thought looked similar. But the, the general properties of it uh, are the same. You have this with like light colors at the top uh, and, and vaguely these, this distribution, uh, or this looking partition, sorry. And uh, so, okay, so that was one thing. So let's see what, what happens if we allow more color terms. What do we do? So what we would like to see now is what we do, uh, humans, we kind of subdivide those colors into smaller parts. And we can see that, like hierarchically, we can see that a little bit. So we can see that this yellow thing here kind of got subdivided. Uh, here, well, I guess this one a little, but again, th this result is, is very difficult to, to kind of evaluate in a qualitative way. So instead, we, we uh, computed some numbers. So it turns out that humans actually communicate efficiently, um, meaning that if we have only one word, so this is an information theoretic measure for efficiency, the uh, communication cost is going to be the surprise uh, by the listener robot when it realizes what color the sender robot uh, actually meant. So if you have only one color term, obviously the sender can only say that color term and your surprise would be one in 330 tiles because that's how many tiles there is, right? So that's maxily, maximally surprised. But when you have more and more colors, uh, this surprise will go down and if you have 330 color terms, then you could potentially have zero surprise if there's no noise. And we can see that the, the, these actually fall in a similar manner as how the surprise endured by humans when they play the same game do. And we actually saw something else that was kind of interesting. So you could ask what is sigma here. So sigma is actually 
uh, for the different curves is the noise that you add. So we had a little thesis. Maybe it is so that the reason that you have fewer color uh, terms when you live in the jungle is because colors aren't that exact. So if we add noise to them, maybe we will get the same behavior that the number of color terms actually used will fall. So the intuition is, I mean, if you, if you refer to things like leaves as green, like they are green, sure, but they can be kind of yellowish and they can be all kinds of colors, but it's still, it's not going to be uh, that important. You're still referring to the same trees just three weeks ago. So maybe if you live in an industrialized society, then you have things like a taxi yellow for a car that's a taxi car. It's going to be very exact or, or the exact color of an iPhone or or other very, very exact colors, there's very little noise on it, then it makes much more sense. You can actually convey the message uh, in a better way using more color terms. And that is uh, exactly what we saw. So depending on how much noise you add, if you add massive amounts of noise, you will end up over here. It will only use about five color terms. It decides to do that. We haven't limited to only using five color terms, but it's just not helpful to use more. So what's going on here is probably that if it were to use more color terms that it needs to use, then uh, the, the, it risks uh, misunderstanding. So that's the regularizing kind of factor here. So having this as a communication loop regularizes this, uh, this representation, this uh, word space, right? Uh, while if we have just a little bit of noise, it turns out that then you get the most number of colors. So these are really fresh results. I, I actually sent the slides three in the morning. Uh, I've heard that many times from the <laughs> organizers. That's why if I look a little bit tired, that might be why. But so we also get, if we have really low zero noise, we actually also get a lower number of utilized words. Uh, and that I don't know why exactly. So if you have any ideas, then please uh, come talk to me. So finally, I would just like to, uh, let's see. Okay, uh, so I can mention a few words about this. Now you, you might say, okay, so colors, that's silly. Uh, there's only 13 words. Does this really generalize to something bigger? I mean, we are using more than 13 words. So actually by just changing this reward function, we're using the exact same algorithm, but now we would like to use all the words, all the nouns, uh, in English. So we use something called WordNet, which is uh, the clauses underlying ImageNet. Maybe ImageNet is something you heard more of. But so WordNet is nouns uh, connected. So you have uh, like a noun that is, let's say, animal. Underneath that, you're going to have things like dog and human and so on. And then under, I don't know, dogs, you will have breeds of dogs. So it's going to be a structure, uh, it's more or less a three structure uh, of concepts. So we wanted to see, okay, so can we learn this concept tree now and learn to refer to things in the same way as we try to refer to color? And, and, and as you can see, yes, we really, we get exactly the same behavior. So we are able to uh, now, when we increase from having very few words, we, we get very low communication efficiency, and as we increase the number of words, we get the same kind of qualitative, uh, quantitative um, uh, behavior as we got with color spaces. Um, we need to do more analysis on this, though. So I'm not going to say more on it, but it kind of shows that, yeah, it seems to generalize. So, some, uh, some conclusions regarding this. So 
so first of all, we think that it, it seems like these RL agents are in fact uh, partitioning color spaces similar, similarly to how humans do it. There is a big variability between different human languages and so on, so it's not super simple to say that yes, uh, we are doing exactly the same, but it does seem to capture similar properties. We do see that using this type of uh, reinforcement learning, efficient communication emerge. And that is not simple. I should point that out. It might seem like a simple task, but it turns out that getting the optimal efficient communication is actually NP-hard. So it's not solvable. And uh, in a previous paper where they tried to do a brute force, or a brute force, they tried to do a, uh, another way of optimizing to find the optimal kind of way of uh, uh, partitioning this color space, they were not able to get this level of communication efficiency that we get solely by running reinforcement learning. So it's not a super simple thing to get, so it's a nice result. And also we, we kind of saw that we could, when we had this nice toy, we could start to manipulate and try different things and see if we could find effects that we could see in, in reality also uh, emerging in, in these uh, communication schemas. Uh, and finally, this framework can be adopted to, to different domains, uh, like words. We are currently working on images, but uh, images is much more data intensive, I realized. It takes much more time to run everything, so uh, language is easier, no? Or am I wrong? Are you working with languages or images in this uh, in this hall? C everyone working with the images, raise a hand. Okay, okay, a language. It's pretty much even. Cool. So for everyone doing languages, stay away from images. It seems difficult. Okay. I will skip this. Sorry. So you read everything, right? Okay. So I will now conclude. Are we better off? I started with grandiose plans of having a dialogue system that solves everything and is your mate and can have a beer with you on Fridays and, and so on. So I'm not sure if we got all the way there, right? But there are some things. So I mentioned these uh, actually in the description of the talk as well. Like, we can now grow our vocabulary. We doesn't necessarily need to have a fixed size vocabulary. We can create new words when we need them to solve the task that we want to solve. So that's actually one big plus here. And we, we did do that. We grounded our concepts, that, and that's huge. That's a very important part. So now we have a word corresponding to an actual color or a word corresponding to an actual concept, and when we're working with images, we have a word corresponding to an actual thing in an image. And that is hugely important when you try to do generalization. If you are to have a robot in the real world, it needs to be able to generalize from things it sees, uh, and not just things that have been written down. So that's great. You kind of get that for free. And you get some kind of communication that at least has a point to it. So it's not just a uh, random gibberish, but it actually has a point to it. So a few caveats. Turns out that if you get do complex things, it is more challenging to solve with reinforcement learning, so you th should think twice. Uh, but then again, this is an emerging field. There's a lot of people working on it. Uh, there have been uh, papers from, uh, from OpenAI and from DeepMind. Uh, we actually had a girl from DeepMind over here just a few weeks ago working on very similar problems as this. Uh, so there is a lot of interest in it, and I think it will, it will grow because there are problems that you really can't solve without doing something like this. Though it is complex, and uh, we are still, sadly, a long way from the uh, digital assistant that I talked about. 
Thank you very much.